Hello, I'm Jacob Kruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay Podcast. So my guest today is Lisa D'Amour. Uh, Lisa is a brilliant playwright. She has taught at some of the finest uh, grad programs in the country, including running the MFA program at Brown. She uh, is a Pulitzer finalist for her play Detroit. And she's also one of my mentors. She is the person that I studied playwriting with when I first came to New York City. And so it is a real honor for me uh, to have Lisa on this podcast and also to have Lisa now teaching for us at the studio. So, and Lisa uh, actually was so kind to squeeze in a little time for us. She's cooking a family dinner in the background. So you may even smell the smells of, <laughs> of home. Um, so we're, we're so oh, grateful for, you, for your time. Lisa. Yeah, sure. Of course. I wanted to ask you first, you know, um, one of the things, you know, whether you're a playwright, a screenwriter, a poet, a novelist, a memoirist, a songwriter, you know, everybody talks about this thing called voice, right? Mm -hmm. And, and developing your play, your voice as a playwright. And, you know, we all know that, you know, the great playwrights that we admire have a specific voice. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if you can talk about in, in your experience, how did you find your voice as a writer? And what, what did that mean to you as you were coming up? Mm, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I sometimes associate voice with things like chemistry and sense of humor, actually. Not that I'm trying to say that in order to find your voice, you have to write funny plays. That's not what I mean at all. But, um, you know, like when you're with friends and you're feeling really at ease and someone makes a joke and suddenly you just find yourself laughing and feeling like so flexible and open? Mm -hmm. And I think that when we, when we are writing, when we're feeling our own voice, when we're writing inside what we call our voice, there's something that feels very pleasurable and very free. And I feel like for me, as a very young writer, before I went to grad school, um, I remember trying to write plays that looked a lot like plays that had like lights up, lights down, um, a single set. Uh, and just kind of trying to fit my words into this structural box. And I remember that one day I just, I was like, you know, I don't know if this will get produced. I don't know if this is what this is going to look like. But I'm curious about these two characters that are hanging out in a New Orleans cemetery. And a New Orleans cemetery is unlike other cemeteries. They have these big above ground kind of tombs and um and i really just let myself be with those two characters and what i remember is finding a lusciousness finding a poetry and in some ways finding some humor um but it was really about letting go of what the what the shape of the play was going to be and just kind of being with this for me with the space and the characters i love what you're saying mm -hmm. there I, I love the word curious you know, mm. I think, especially I know early in my career, um, you know, I, I was I was always a student of writing. And so I was always studying, you know, the masters. I was always studying the scripts that I loved. And and that caused a, a kind of intellectual approach for me early in my career where, mm -hmm. where I was trying to control everything. And mm -hmm. I always felt like voice was my weakest thing at the beginning of my career. Now I actually feel it's where my strength is. Um, but at the beginning of my career, I always felt like I don't even know what people are talking about when they say voice. You know, I'm just, I'm putting the Legos together mm -hmm. and trying to make the Death Star, you know. And mm -hmm. um, that lesson about curiosity, right, mm -hmm. starting from a place of curiosity rather than control, is, is yes, I love that. That's great. Yeah, and and I think also just like being, letting yourself be, and see what see what feels good to you, see what cracks you up in your own writing can sometimes be a good sign. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I talk about that moment when you're like, 
oh my God, I just wrote that. Can I write that? Am I allowed to write that? And that's yeah. usually a good moment. <laughs> because yeah so so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting process uh and a kind of it's hard to name that process of finding your voice so yeah and and i like what you said about like am i allowed to say that you know mm. because i think often the you know when we actually start to crack that shell and actually start to find our voice what happens mm -hmm. is and we're actually just dipping into this subconscious place in ourselves and, and mm -hmm. we start to write things that are not comfortable um, mm -hmm. and that make us feel extremely vulnerable and that a lot of us will have the instinct to just dismiss it as bad, you know, because it's not like anything you've seen before. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's uncomfortable and it's a lot like, you or maybe it's a lot like a part of you that you are not really comfortable being a part of you um and so i i like i like what you're saying about giving yourself permission to mm -hmm. to write the thing that you're interested in for whatever reason i'm interested in these two people at a gravesite, uh, mm -hmm. or um or i'm looking for that thing where i'm like am i allowed to write it you're looking for the thing that's that's disruptive for you. Mm. Um, and I'm and also, yeah. for, I would just say that for me too, uh, like we're talking about voice, but I also sometimes talk about being in the zone. We all know what that feels like when we're kind yeah. of in the zone and we lose track of time and we're in the world of our play. And for me, that is a very sensory experience. I hear the characters speaking. I am very aware of the texture of the world that they're in. And um, so it's, it's, it's beyond just dialogue. It's, it's a very sens sensory and sensual experience for me anyway, when I feel like I'm kind of writing inside of my voice. So yeah. how do you, cause we, you know, we all have those days where it's like, hey, there's my voice, I'm in it, right? I'm in the zone, the, the muse is speaking <laughs> through me, right? And those are such great days. How do you approach it when the muse is like, go away i'm not talking to you today mm -hmm. yes totally i thought you were going to ask me for the recipe to get there every time and i was going to have to disappoint you I, if i if that recipe existed we we would be <laughs> we would be very yes. um the two things that come to mind are the timer technique set a timer for 20 minutes say you're going to write for 20 minutes without stopping even if you think it's bad writing and like make yourself write till that timer goes off, even though it's torture. And, and then look at it the next day. I mean, I, sometimes I'll do that for like three or four, you know, I try to do it for three or four 20 minute se segments. But then when I go and look at it the, the next day, I'm like, oh, look, there's a little something I can use. There's a little something I can use. Um, so we often, uh, we're often, uh, things are coming out, we're writing, I don't want to say better than we thought we were, because that's a terrible way of putting it. Um, but I think just when you're not feeling it, whatever structure you can give yourself to just get some words on the page, or whether that's writing or typing. Another technique I like to do is, um, I have this deck of cards called Oblique Strategies that you probably know about, Jacob. It's, um, it's a deck of cards created by Brian Eno. And they're little prompts that you can, if I'm like stuck, I can pick up the, this card and it might say something like, try the reverse or something like that. And it will just like jog my brain enough. And that deck of cards is something you can buy, but you can also find a way that you can like generate a card online if you just Google oblique strategies. So I think structure and then things to kind of just jog your brain, jog you outside of your head to kind of get writing again. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I actually, I wasn't aware of those cards. Um, but oh yeah, it, check them out. It reminds me of something, my, my fiance Lacey um, actually uses tarot cards in a similar way. Um, mm. she, she does life coaching for artists and she's also a writer. We're actually, in the new year, we're hoping to offer a tarot for writing class with her. But she uses them in a very right. similar way where it's not, she's not using them as archetypes you know, in the way that they're traditionally used, she's not using for, for fortune telling, but she's using them almost like a Rorschach test that kind of allows you to look at what are you really trying to say and, and what, is the, what is the meaning and where do you really want to go? Um, and so mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea 
of, of introducing something random. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think that when we're not feeling the muse or when we're feeling blocked, we create kind of a tunnel vision for ourselves, you know, and our view becomes very limited. And I think sometimes using a card or sometimes I'll even either just even just take a book off the shelf and say, I'm going to open and see what this page has to say to me and use that as as something that can like jog me back into yeah. writing. There's a there's a line in a movie called The, the Zero Effect, um, which is a... Um, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a Sherlock Holmes update. And I always thought it was such a great metaphor for writing, but the Sherlock Holmes character says that when most people try to solve a crime, uh, they start by looking for something very specific, uh, mm -hmm. which is always a mistake because out of all the things in the world, you're only looking for one of them. He says, mm -hmm. when I'm trying to solve a crime, I start by looking for anything because out of all the things in the world, you're mm -hmm. likely to find something. And I always thought that was like one of the greatest pieces of advice, of advice ever for writers. Mm -hmm. that, that, that random thing that you don't, that, that shakes up your control can give you that, that window into, into your subconscious and, and, and into what you're really trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, so you're, just to kind of ask you some follow-up questions, you're, you're, you're doing this exercise where you're forcing you to, yourself to write whether you like it or not, whether it feels horrible or not for 20 minutes, and you're generating some maybe wonderful, maybe horrible pages. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at them the following day or a couple of days later, What's your approach to looking at them? How, how, do you, how do you think about them as you're reading them over again? Mm -hmm. uh, do you mean how do I take it in in terms of thinking about rewriting? Sure. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, I definitely try and start by just reading them over and trying not to stop and take any notes. Try to just kind of read it. I'm probably taking notes somewhere back here. Yeah. Um, but then I also like to think about them in terms of, uh, it also depends, Jacob, on what phase of writing I'm in. Right. So if I'm looking at some pages and I already know what the play is, and I kind of know where the play is going, then I may stop and try and figure out, um, well, how, how is this, how are these pages showing me, or how are these pages serving, say, this particular theme in the play? And it might be like, oh, if I, if I change this word or two, or if I change this interaction between these two, these two characters, that might help this theme emerge a little bit, like a little touchstone for the, for the audience. Um, so I sometimes might look at them in terms of different things that I know are traveling through the play and how that scene will serve them. Yeah. Um, another thing I always do is I'm always trying to figure out how I can say something with four words instead of 20. Uh, and and so, so sometimes I'm looking, it's not even really about making the play go faster, but just about tightening and having control over the energy of the scene. Mm -hmm. So that I understand like when I need the scene to go faster, when I, need, when I need it to go slower, and how can I do it with the greatest efficiency? Yeah, that, what's so interesting is you're really talking about the two different sides of the brain, right? You have mm -hmm. this, the subconscious mind where it's just like, I have to set her free and let her write, right? I got to get this stuff out of my head where it's perfect and amorphous and get it onto the page where it's going to be flawed, but at least it's physically there. Um, yes. And then this, this other side of your brain that is, is really the editing brain, that's really the conscious mind that's going either how do I use this within the framework or how do I compress it? How do I increase its, its power by, by squishing it down to its, its bare essentials? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also really liked what you had to say about theme, right? Because mm -hmm. it's starting to, to kind of point the way, and, and this is one of the things that I loved about studying with you, is mm -hmm. I learned, you know, I was very new to playwriting. I had started as a playwright in college, but really my career was built in screenwriting. And mm -hmm. so coming back to playwriting for me was, was learning a, a new art form. And mm. one of the things that I really appreciated about studying with you was that, that you did so much to free my, my subconscious mind, but that you okay. did 
also mm-hmm. always a layer of structure there, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that you were really help, able to help us easily make that transition from unconscious writing to structure. And mm-hmm. you, you brought up one of the tools that you use uh, when you talked about theme. And so Mm -hmm. I I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about theme and and how theme functions in in a play for you and and how do you find your theme? Mm, That's great. Uh, Usually when I start, I I may have a a question that I have about some characters. And I don't know that I would say when I start writing a play that I could like absolutely articulate the theme, you know? Uh, But I think that as I'm writing, there's a point about halfway through where I'm like, oh, this is what this play is about and this is where it's going, right? And, um, And I have to say for me, I think it was Sherry Kramer that told me um, something like, you know, you, we try and write about everything, but make it look like we're writing about nothing. And I think that's the thing that I'm always thinking about is how can I write about big issues like maybe suburban fear of the American economy or the economy crashing, but make it look like two couples having a barbecue. Yeah. You know? And so I, I have to say sometimes some of my work on, on like letting a theme travel through the play is tricking an audience into not thinking about the theme until a very particular moment when I want them to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a magic trick, to yeah. be honest. Um, and, and I think that actually, and also it's the kind of thing too where it's so tricky because if you turn up the volume too much on what you're trying to say, suddenly the audience feels talked down to. Yeah. So that is the other thing that I'm always trying to parse out is how to kind of um, really let the characters and the place and the action kind of embody the ideas that I'm trying to talk about. So, you know, sometimes like in my play Detroit, there's a, there's a very subtle theme of like fire and cooking that travels through the whole play. And it's different people barbecuing, different people lighting candles. But by the end of the play, the whole house burns down. Mm -hmm. And it really starts to say something about the, let's say the repressed American dream in the suburbs, let's just call it that, you know? But I didn't really, you know, it was was after after I wrote the first play and maybe even after I wrote the second play that I was able, the second draft, uh, the first draft and the second draft that I was able to kind of like, track that system through and realize how it was speaking or revealing what the play was about. Yeah. So, and, and so, so sometimes think, it can be an image that travels through that helps you track your theme or convey your theme. Yeah. I know I've always found that in my own writing is, mm-hmm. you know, I'm always looking, cause I do the bad, uh, the bad writing exercise as well. Um, you know, I have a terrible problem with perfectionism. And so I, I have to shake myself up and I have to force myself in that way. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, often when I'm looking at rough pages, especially when I don't know where things are going, what I'm kind of looking for are images that, that either I don't understand or that, mm-hmm. that feel important or that move me in some way. And, and then I just kind of try to come back to those images again and again and again. Just how many mm-hmm. times can I reuse them? How many different ways can I reuse them? And with a kind of curiosity, like I'm coming back to your word, right? Like mm-hmm. a curiosity of like, well, what does all this actually mean? Like, what am I actually trying to say with that? And, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering for you, how much is a plan? Like, do you know that the place is going to burn down and then do you work backwards to the candle or, or do do you find the candle and, and then one day you realize, Oh my God, it's going to burn down or is it different in different projects? Wow. It's really different in different projects. And, uh, and with Detroit, it was especially different. I don't know that it's happened this way before, but the play had a totally different ending. It didn't burn down in the first draft. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was only when I realized like, wow, I felt like the play was kind of building to something and then to use the right word fizzled out. And I was like, this needs to be something bigger needs to happen. Something bigger needs to happen. And, uh, and that's when I realized like, Oh, right. Like they actually want to tear this whole thing down. They want to burn this whole thing down. And so then it was after that, that I was able to go through and kind of track, track the moments leading up to that. I would say for me in general, um, I, 
I may have an idea of like, oh, this idea keeps coming up. I'm going to, I'm going to let it repeat. I'm going to, I'm going to fold it in, even though I don't totally understand it yet. And then maybe by the end of writing the play, I understand it. And then I go back and do a lot of revising. Yeah. I always think, you know, you've brought up something so important, which is, you know, we write plays because we want to move people, you know, yeah. um, and you know, but, but there's a, there's a big difference between theme and moral, you know, there's a big mm -hmm. difference between I'm moving you and because I've moved you, you've made a choice to think about the world in a slightly different way mm -hmm. um, versus I, I preach to you. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I told you what you're supposed to think. Um, and, you know, and I, I've always felt like, you know, there are wonderful movies that do that, but I've always questioned and wonderful plays that do that, but I've always questioned whether people went go, yeah, I really should do that and just kind of move on. Mm -hmm. Whereas I always feel like if you're able to get, uh, if you're able to get a, 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 an audience to connect and to wonder and to question and to wrestle, you know, mm -hmm. I've always felt that they then internalize mm -hmm. and, and kind of come to their own solution. And, mm -hmm. and one of the ways that, that I try to do that is by, is by trying to write something that's a little bigger than I understand. Or if I, I get on my soapbox trying to kind of attack my own beliefs, um, mm -hmm. trying to find a character that, that has a really strong counter argument or, um, or trying to find a situation where my own beliefs really don't work um, to kind of test myself and kind of look what, what's, what's out on the other side. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious in your own writing, like um, how, how much do you think about message when, mm -hmm. when you write? That's great. How much do I think about message? Well, I think that in most of my work, I'm very interested in making room for people who are watching it to want to go out and talk, engage, or feel differently about just people who are very different from them, people that they have never encountered before. So I feel like that might be kind of the hidden message in a lot of my plays is like, get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Try, you know, see, see what happens if you go out into the world and, and mix with people you haven't mixed with before. So, and I think that's just, you know, I, I, I come from a very extroverted and diverse city of New Orleans in which it's actually quite easy to be around a mix of people. And uh, so I think that's just kind of in my bones, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's like your um, DNA. Yeah, and I have to say, in terms of like an overt message, like my plays aren't really battle cry plays, personally. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think you come out of them with like, this is how you must change the world, you know? Um, but I do think, uh, I think I try to think about like, how does, how do my plays open up an audience to something that's just like a little bit new in their lives, whether it's a kind of, a, a kind of play structure they've never seen before, a kind of character they've never seen before. Um, so I'm very interested in, in pushing an audience into the new, depending on whichever kind of theme or idea I'm writing about. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know that I've ever used the word message. Yeah. When I think about my, my writing, I, I know other playwrights that probably do and, and do that really well. Yeah. It's just not a word that resonates with me. Well, you know, you did that uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a quarantinis with you and you did that mm -hmm. wonderful excerpt where we were looking at, at uh, Susan Laurie Park's uh, top dog underdog. And, you know, there's no doubt that that is a political play. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, it, and there's a whole tradition of agitprop theater, right? You know, mm -hmm. theater to get people to rise up. Um, but I, I, I think there's something so profoundly powerful, you know, about when we kind of humble, humble ourselves a little bit as authors, uh, as writers mm -hmm. and say, you know, maybe I don't have all the answers, but like, maybe I can provoke the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, you know, how can I expose myself to somebody I don't know? How can I expose my play to ideas that are not mine? You know, mm-hmm. and, and how we wrestle with it. And I think in that way, like, all of our work is political because you know, what we're doing is we're building empathy. You know, we're, we're allowing, we're an, allowing an audience to feel empathy. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it, from my point of view, that's, that's one of the most political things that you can do uh, because mm-hmm. it has power to change the world. Great. Yes, totally. I mean, I'm just, I can't wait for us to be able to gather again uh, just because being in a live theater together god it's so weird you can't just saying breathing the same air now yeah. sounds like dangerous you yeah. know it's so weird yeah. um but just that chemistry of being in a group watching live actors on stage it can it can really spark so much and what i love i i just love plays as a as a vehicle for for healthy arguments back in the restaurant bar or in your home afterwards about yeah. like what, what you thought the play was about. Yeah. Um, because just that is like waking up people's bodies, minds, and hearts, right? Which is kind of what we're trying to do, so. Beautiful. So yeah. many of the questions I've asked you and your answers have actually been valuable really for any kind of writing, you know? Uh, Great. You apply these ideas, whether you're a screenwriter for sure, whether you're a novelist, whether you're writing a memoir, um, but I'd love to talk with you a little bit in the few minutes we have left about, um, about some of the things that are really unique to theater. And, and you know, you spoke first of about being in the room with live actors, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that, that feeling and that energy that, that only happens in, in a theater. Um, mm-hmm. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about the other things in the way you see it that, that are unique about playwriting and, um, and, and the opportunities that are there in playwriting that might not be there if you were writing a film or a novel or a TV show? Mm, yeah. Well, you know, a play is a blueprint for a rehearsal and a collaboration with actors, directors, and designers, for starters, right? It's also a collaboration with Um, all the other people that bring the play into being and the audience. Um, So I'm always trying to figure out like, how does my play leave room for the imagination of the people who are going to put it up, you know? And it's, it's not something that I'm thinking about with every line of dialogue that I write. Um, But I often think about it in terms of things like stage directions. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about like, how is the stage direction something that is like, helping an actor and director know what should happen, but giving them a lot of freedom as to how it's going to happen. So I think that's one thing. And I feel like you really, you learn that through writing a scene or a short play and getting someone to do it and see what it looks like to see it translated up on stage. You know, I think that my approach to rewriting has changed a lot over the, I guess, what is it, almost 20 years that I've been writing, because I start to realize, like, I could obsess over this line now, or I could wait and collaborate with an actor on it in the rehearsal room. You know what I mean? So in some ways, it's made me a little bit less of a perfectionist, because I know things are going to change once I'm going into rehearsal. Um, But mostly, I think that uh, some things, so there's, there's that. One is this blueprint for an actor and director is very different than writing a play, or I imagine even a screenplay. I don't have that much experience with screenplay. Um, But I think also realizing, like, when I write a line of dialogue, (laughs) it's like I'm writing the tip of the iceberg, right? It's like I'm writing just the surface, and both the audience and what they're projecting into that line and the actor and what they're bringing to it is bringing a whole lot more. So I think there's kind of a, a, a weird less is more um, quality with some kinds of, of playwriting um, because you're always want to make room for what the actor is bringing and what the audience is bringing. Yeah. Um, so I, I wish I had a specific example of that for you right now, but it's something that I think about a lot. Yeah. Well, I, I think what you're pointing out about rehearsal is so valuable to think about, you know, because mm-hmm. as, as screenwriters, you know, people say screenwriting is blue, a uh, blueprint, but honestly, unless you are very, very famous, that's not really an option. You know, mm-hmm. we have to fully visualize. Um, yes. We don't that's get rehearsal. I do. 
And also because the people reading our plays, you know, are our screenplays are often not really trained in, in, in reading. And so, you know, we have to make it just appear in the little movie screen in their mind without them having to bring a lot of creativity to it themselves. Mm. Whereas in playwriting, you get this wonderful thing called rehearsal. Um, and, and where you actually get to play with, with a cast and a brilliant director and, and really explore the shape of, of what something is and, and, and what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the other thing that's exciting about that is like, you can do that now as a playwright in a way you can't as a screenwriter. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can grab five actors on Zoom and you can and you can rehearse a play and you yeah. can explore a play and you can do it unlike a film which is so expensive you can do it for for nothing um totally. and you'll learn so incredibly much about who you are as, a, as an artist um mm -hmm. which leads me to the last thing i wanted to kind of talk to you about which is you know uh <laughs> Back when I moved to New York, I used to call it the reverse commute uh, because I started as a screenwriter and, and I actually came to New York to direct theater. And, mm -hmm. and all my playwright friends were like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, we're all going where, where you came from. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of playwrights recently kind of get picked up you know, by people who see their plays and see what they can do and get mm -hmm. picked up primarily for television because mm -hmm. of, you know, their ability to understand character, to understand drama, to understand dialogue. And mm -hmm. I know uh, screenwriting is not primarily what you do. You kind of stayed in that theater world. And I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of your friends have probably made that transition. And I'm curious. Uh, yeah, mostly to TV. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, uh, what is it that keeps you in the theater world, and what what are the the skills that you think your 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 um, your peers who have moved into television? What are the skills that you think that they picked up in playwriting that were really valuable as they made that transition? Oh, that's a great question because it is true the playwrights are getting snapped up right and left for these shows, uh, and um, uh, I, you know I think it's one. I would say the first and most important thing is the ability to imagine a world. Mm -hmm. And to really know how to build out a world, a world that could continue week to week to week that you want to be in, that you want to keep exploring, that can keep unfolding. Yeah. And I think that when you're writing a play, there's a real sense of the world that the characters are, are living in and the specific tone of that world, too. I mean, especially right now, there's, so, there's such a variety of style in terms of how people are telling stories in TV. And it doesn't surprise me that playwrights are making the move because... You know, uh, there, there are playwrights right now that are s experimenting with so many forms in the theater, with comedy, with satire, with nonlinear mm -hmm. kinds of plays. And I think even playwrights who have their maybe biggest success with a more naturalistic or linear approach to playwriting, almost all of them have written plays that appear a bit wilder, you know, that appear like they operate by a different set of rules, because I think that's what you learn when you're trying things out or in a playwriting school. So I think that playwrights are bringing a real kind of nimble, nimbleness to, to TV writing right now. Um, and of course, also, I think the understanding that like a great character is filled with great contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is just something that so many, I mean, most of my experiences with American playwrights, and I feel like the playwrights that I know are not afraid to allow a character to exist on stage with many contradictions. Um, so those are two things I can think of. Yeah, and I can see how valuable that would be in a writer's room, you know, not just from a career perspective that, yes, one of the easiest ways to end up in a writer's room is actually to succeed as a playwright. Um, but uh, It's true. And also, as you know, Jacob, it, it used to be that you, you would have to write a spec script to get on a TV show, like kind of write a kind of fake episode of a, yeah. of a TV yeah. show, but more and more now people are getting hired just from their plays. Yes. Yeah. So play, play, you know, like if you're, if you're a writer who's interested in both theater and TV, starting in playwriting and writing a couple of really great plays um, can also really serve your TV career. Yeah. And, and also, you know, 
as you were, were describing, the, um, the, the, the artistry of playwriting is, mm -hmm. is also so incredibly valuable to, to, uh, to, to, screen, to, 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 to TV writers' rooms because you have to keep those characters going. And, mm -hmm. you know, in a screenplay, maybe an hour and a half, maybe I can survive with a character who doesn't have, you know, layers upon layers upon layers. But in a, in a show that's going to run for five seasons, if you don't have those layers, if you don't have the artists who can bring those layers, then, mm -hmm. then your show's going to run out of steam. And, and I right. think that's one of the reasons. It's not just because playwrights happen to write great dialogue. It's, it's that, that they understand character, and so they become incredibly valuable in the writing room. Um, you're about to teach a four-week class for us, uh, which I'm so excited that we're able to offer. Um, and, and I wonder if you could just talk briefly about, about that class and about how it's going to work and what you're going to be teaching. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. In many ways, I, I would like to really touch on some of the things that we were talking about today. Building a world, creating characters that are filled with contradiction and that entice us. And also, what does it mean for a play to have a style and tone that is uniquely your own? Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do to explore this is I, I want us to look at two different, very different plays. One is my play Detroit, because I, I actually love teaching my own work because I can go into a lot of backstory about why things are the way they are. You have access. Um, and the other play that I want to look at is a play called Booty Candy by Robert O'Hara, which is an incredibly different ride than Detroit. It's episodic. It has a very different tone. It's hilarious. And I want to look at both of those plays and kind of how they were built. What are the expectations that the writers kind of um, seed into the opening scenes of the plays? How, do those, how does that kind of launch a journey in each play? And how does it carry through? And we'll be doing some writing exercises to see if we can try and do some of that on our own. And I think that there'll be a way, if you're, working, if you're currently working on a play, there'll be a way to work on it in the class. Or if you're just starting a play, there'll be a, lots of opportunities to just start and try some things as well. That's really exciting. And, and, and that, that class uh, is going to actually culminate in a one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, with one of our mentors here at the studio mm -hmm. so that you can get feedback on the writing you do and, 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 and so you can really understand how you're, how you're implementing those, those ideas that come up during class. So mm -hmm. I'm so excited that you're part of our faculty now. Um, Lisa's also available for ProTrack if you want to study with her one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, thank you so much for giving us your time on such a busy day. Of course. It's really great to see you, Jacob. Thanks. This is, I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm looking forward to next week. Me too. I'll see you soon. Great. Bye-bye.